Good morning, class. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, our husband. It's okay. Hey. I hope we can start now. Let's say. Let's say. Oh, great. So it's been about two weeks since we we met as a class to have a lecture. Yes. So this is our sit lecture, and I want to look at teaching methods, teaching methodologies. So having learned the principles of teaching and learning, and having looked at what adult learning is. We want to go ahead to look at some of the various methods that we can use to teach adults. So the various methods that we can use to teach adults, not children. So this particular lecture is about teaching adults, teaching adults, not children. So I will, I will encourage everyone mm -hmm. to participate fully and uh, whatever you don't understand, please you draw our attention. Now on the pic on the diagram or let's say on the screen, you can see a picture. What can you see on that picture? What what is the picture about? Can somebody tell me what you can see from the picture? Mm -hmm. What can you see? Tell me. Anybody can unmute and speak. Sir. Yes, please. I can see a teacher uh, sitting down and teaching students. And they are also paying attention. So you can see a teacher. Um, and some students. With some students. And what is the teacher holding? A book. A book. All right. So where, where do you think they are seated? The environment. How do you describe the environment? Are they sitting outside? Are they sitting in a classroom? Are they sitting in a lab? Are they sitting in a field? Which, which kind of environment are they sitting in? Classroom. They are in a classroom. They are in a classroom. Oh, great. So yeah. this morning, we first want to start with... I want to start with teaching method. When we say teaching method, what are the teaching methods in terms of definition? What do we say are teaching methods? So methods, we are referring to principles. We are referring to general principles. And aside principles, we are referring to pedagogy. Then we are referring to management strategies that we use in classrooms. So we want to talk about teaching the general principles. We looked at 10 general principles. And these principles has to do with teaching and learning. What you need to know about the learner and as a teacher, what you also need to know about the classroom so that to enhance your teaching and learning effectively. So we looked at the psychological principles. Uh -huh. So you need to think about the learner, what the learner thinks, what the learner is bringing into the classroom, what can motivate the learner. These are all general principles. Uh, so what we are saying is that in trying to select a type of teaching method, <laughs> we have to why so? Sir, please, can you meet all of us? Oh. 
Beleza, suíço. Uhum. Fucena. Uhum. Fucena. Yes. So then the pedagogy. The pedagogy has to deal with the type of people you are teaching. So are you teaching adults or you are teaching children? So what we are trying to say is that your ability to select a teaching method is dependent on the pedagogy. That is, if you are teaching children, there are certain teaching methods you select. If you are also teaching adults, then there are also certain teaching methods that you have to look at. Then the management strategies. So in teaching and learning, the method that you select you have to look at it, whether you can manage that particular teaching method. So in management, we are talking about the learners. Can you control the behavior of the learners if you select a particular teaching method? So if you want to do demonstration, for example, demonstration, we are saying that in selecting demonstration as a teaching method, Will you be able to control your learners during the demonstration process? If you want to send them to a skills lab, you have to think about it. Will I be able to control the students if I send them to a skills lab for demonstration? So these are management strategies. Your ability to control the learners influence the specific teaching method that you ought to select so that you can teach and your teaching objectives will be met. So yes, so teaching is about the principles, the method is about the principles, about the type that the pedagogy, whether children or adult, and then the management strategies, whether you can control the learners and then the classroom. So that refers to teaching method. Now, teaching methods can be classified. So broadly, we classify teaching methods into two. And what are the two classification of teaching methods? So we have teacher-centered teaching methods, and then we have learner-centered teaching methods. So when we say teacher-centered, it also refers to as expository methods. So I'll explain further when we go to the next slide. But teacher teaching method refers to expository teaching methods. Then the learner centered. So when we say teacher centered, expository comes from the English word expose, expose. So in this teacher centered teaching methods, the teacher is the one that has the knowledge. And this knowledge that the teacher has, he or she is going to reveal the knowledge or is going to display the knowledge for the learners to understand. So you are exposing the knowledge that is inside you as a teacher. So it's like you have the hidden knowledge inside you. But you want to show the learners what it is through exposition. So exposing the knowledge. So that's why it's called expository method of teaching. Now, the teacher-centered method is called, it's also called the search the stage. So search the stage. So stage, what is stage? Stage is a platform. So if you are called to come out and stand in front of people, that is a stage. So standing in front of a group of people, we call that platform a stage. Now we said that the teacher method is about what? exposition. 
So it means that before you can expose knowledge, you need a platform. You need a stage. You need an audience. You need a group of people to be together so you can stand before them and expose whatever hidden knowledge you have in you to the lens. So that's why it's called search the stage. Uh, you, need, you need a platform. You need a group of people so you can transmit whatever message that you have. So looking at the teacher-centered methods, we have some examples. Uh, some teaching examples that we can say they are teacher-centered. Morning. Okay, so the typical example we all know is what? Lecture. What I am doing currently. I'm lecturing. So what is side the stage? So the Zoom, the Zoom is a platform. Uh, the Zoom is a platform that I'm using to transmit the knowledge to you. So we are, I'm exposing the knowledge through lecture, through ways. Then you can also do storytelling. So you gather a group of people together. Then you tell them a story. So the story, you the story is inside you, but you are exposing it to a group of people. So it's exposure, expository, or explanation. Within a group of people, you explain certain concepts, certain ideas to them, or instruction. So all these are examples of the teacher-centered teaching methods. So in case you meet any of these, that lecture, storytelling, explanation, and instruction, these are that. all expository methods, which are the same as what teacher-centered methods. Teacher-centered methods. Now, what about the learner-centered or the student-centered? So the learner centered or the student what centered. So here the focus is on the student or the focus is on the learner. So these methods, they try as much as possible to help the learner to drive the most out of the teaching and learning. So we are saying that these methods are most beneficial to the learner. So the learner is able to participate actively and fully. And because of that participation actively and fully and consciously, the learner is able to get the best out of the teaching method. So what is the role of the teacher in the learner-centered method? In the learner center method, the teacher is only a facilitator. That is all. The teacher is a facilitator in the learner centered method. So, what, what it meant is that the teacher is to guide, the teacher is to guide the students or the learners to discover the knowledge. So, it is not the teacher who is standing before them giving them all the knowledge from A to Z. No. In this method, the teacher is a facilitator, which means that you only help them to discover the knowledge by themselves. So what are some of the methods that falls under learner or teacher-centered? So conversation. So if you throw a question to the student and you ask them to converse. So the, the teacher here, you are only a facilitator because you only give the you only give the student the direction. So you tell the student the topic to converse on. Then the students take it. Then discussion. Right. A classroom discussion. The teacher only gives their topic. But the learners 
we'll have to get the format for the discussion and bring the ideas on board. So the ideas are not from the teacher, it's from the learners. So the learners bring their own knowledge. So problem solving, troubleshooting, demonstration, modeling. These are all student-centered methods. So basically what we are trying to say is that all these methods, they help the students the more. They help the students to acquire the knowledge by themselves to acquire the knowledge or to generate the knowledge by themselves. So all the ideas are coming from the learners, but not the teacher. The teacher is only a facilitator. That means you have to guide them to develop their own knowledge. So we said we have two classifications of teaching methods, teacher-centered and learner-centered. And we have looked at examples and the teacher centered, then examples and the learner centered. Please, is there any question so far on teacher centered learning and then student centered teaching methods? Is there, or somebody want to add up something? You can add up. Or you want to clarify something before we proceed? Sir, please, can you go over a slide again? The student centered. Which one? The student centered. The student centered. Yes, the conversation, collective discussion, and that. Can you go over? Okay. okay. So the student centered or the learner centered. So here we say that the teaching method you select should focus on the student. It should focus on the learner. And when we say focus on the learner, what we are saying is that whichever teaching method you select, it should help the learner to acquire the information by themselves. So the teaching method is to help the learner to discover the information by themselves. Now, if the learner is able to discover the information by him or herself, what it meant is that whatever you acquire on your own, it becomes yours. So it means that the knowledge that we the learner gets, it becomes that of the learner, and it can be stored over a long period of time because then the learner was able to discover the knowledge by him or herself. Now we ask that what is the role of the teacher in the student learning method, the student centered? What is the role of the so? In this method, we are saying that the teacher serves as a facilitator. So what is a, facil or is a facilitator? So we are saying that a facilitator, you only guide or you only help the student to discover the information by themselves. So you are directing the path. You are directing the path of the knowledge acquisition. And we now said, okay, let's take the first one, conversation. You want students to converse on a particular topic. The student cannot just start conversing when they don't know what they are to converse on. So the teacher who is the facilitator, you have to guide them by directing them with a topic. So the teacher gives them a specific topic. Please, within the next five minutes, converse on management of hypertension. So you have directed them by showing them their path. So that's the role of the teacher, a facilitator. 
if it's about discussion, the same thing. You give them the specific material you want them to discuss. So you serve as a facilitator. But the ideas, the ideas are not coming from the teacher, but the ideas are coming from the students. Uh, so the students are generating their own ideas and bringing their own ideas together. That makes it student-centered. The knowledge that we are acquiring is from the students to the teacher. So the students are bringing their knowledge and telling the teacher exactly what the knowledge is. That's why it's called student-centered. So we have, all these are examples of student-centered methods. Now, going forward in the slides, we will take these major ones. I will take the major teaching learning methods and we try to look at each of them and the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so, but for now, you are just to know that these examples fall under student or learner-centered methods. Please, my sister, are you okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. You are welcome, please. So moving forward, we want to look yes, at. Please, I have a question. Yes, please. You can so ask. Does that mean we can classify presentation group presentation as student centered? Presentation. Uh, Elena. Yes. yes. You can classify presentation as learner centered if the the learners are the people doing the presentation. And so if uh, the, the teacher serves as a facilitator and gives you a topic to go and develop your own knowledge. Uh, so here in the presentation, the teacher only gives you the topic that group one, go and work on this topic for presentation. So you have to go and get the knowledge all by yourself as students. And then when you come, you not try to let other people get the knowledge that you have discovered. So the teacher serves as a facilitator. By you, the student, you generate the knowledge. You find the knowledge by, by yourself. So yes, presentation, because it involves discovering of knowledge by the student, then it's a student-centered method. But on the day of the presentation, so as we are saying, from the student to your college students or from the student to the lecturer or the teacher. So it's student-centered. Uh, it's not the lecturer who is giving you the knowledge. You are seated and the lecturer is giving you the knowledge. No. Uh, but you are rather telling the lecturer the knowledge that you have developed or you have acquired on your own. So yes, yeah, it's a teaching method that falls and the learner-centered. Hello, sir. Yes, please. Sir, please, I also have a question. So please, uh, where can we classify assignments? Because for that one, it's not like presentation that you will demonstrate to your other colleagues. So, Okay, so assignments. No, we have types of assignments. But generally, generally, if you put assignments, assignments are student-centered. Okay. okay. The focus is who, who gets the knowledge or who generates the knowledge. So you ask yourself, the assignment, is this a student who is going to search for the knowledge and acquire it? Or it is a lecturer who is going to search for the knowledge and bring it to you? And so when you look at the issue of assignment, when we give assignment, the lecturer or the teacher only directs specifically where to go and get the knowledge. Uh, so if the teacher gives you a question, the teacher at that point is a facilitator. Then the teacher is directing you exactly where to go and develop your knowledge. But the knowledge itself, the focus 
of the assignment is on the student. So if I give an assignment on the maybe management of PPA. Now at that moment, the assignment I've given on management of PPH, my focus as a teacher is that I want you, the student, to go and read on PPA yourself, manage it yourself, and learn it well. So at that moment, you, you are going to acquire the knowledge as a, as a student. So the knowledge will stay with you. Uh, but it will become teacher-centered if the teacher comes to lecture you on management of PPH. So in that way, you, the student, you are just sitting down and the teacher is exposing the thing to you. So you might not even understand it. You might not even owe it yourself. But if I say go and write as an assignment, management of PPH, as you are writing, as you are writing, you are remembering the points. Uh -huh. So you are organizing it in your... So as you write each point, by the time you finish writing the assignment on the management of PPH, you realize that you have developed the knowledge yourself and the knowledge can become yours because you went and search for it. Uh, so, yes, it becomes... Uh, okay. It becomes... Hello, sir. Yes, please. Please, can we take the assignment? Our sister has uh, set as an example as problem solving. The assignment? Yes, please. Yes, the assignment is part of problem solving. It is it is one of the ways that we can solve problems. Uh -huh. So assignment could be a problem solving. We can also give you other things like role play or we can even give you case scenarios. All these could be problem solving things that we can give you. So yes. Say. Yes, please. Sir, please, can you um explain the troubleshooting and modeling? Thank you. The troubleshooting and modeling. Oh please, yes. All right, all right. Okay, so the reason why I don't want to waste my time on this one is that we are just coming to do them. Are you okay? Oh, okay, say so I'm okay. That's what I mentioned. We are coming to do them. We are now coming to take uh, the major ones and explain each of them, give the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but for this slide and the previous slide, my focus is not to take each and explain into detail. Uh, my, so my focus is not to explain lecture into detail, no. But my focus is for you to understand that lecture force and the teaching method and the rest here to my focus for you to understand that these all these things fall under student centered method or learner method uh, then we now progress and we now take each of them and look at advantages and my hand has been up for a long time yes so right now for example if i take this and i start talking about lecture uh, the way i've organized to teach you you might not follow the way I want you to follow. It you might be distracted in organizing the knowledge. It's not so, your hand is up. You can ask your question. Say. Hello, say. Please come ask your question. Huh. Okay, with the assignment. Um, I was thinking that oh, you see that usually that after maybe a lecture. Yeah. Then the teacher may want to assess whether you understand, you understood what, what was um, given to you. Yeah. Uh -huh. So then, do you classify that one? Uh, like, when they give that assignment, based on what they've already taught, for mm. you to recollect, uh -huh. I was seeing it as an ass assessment. So here, it's kind of conflicting. I need clarification. Okay, so the assignment, we have assignment as a teaching method. Then we also have assignment as an assessment method. Now, why do we say we have assignment as teaching and assignment as assessment? You have looked at assignment 
as a way of assessment, which means that I have taught you the material and I've decided to now give you, to elicit your knowledge on the material in the form of an assignment. And that's how you are looking at it. Now, even from that angle, if I decide to teach you on the management of PPH in class through lecture, okay. and after the lecture, I give you assignment that is go and outline. Yes, I got nothing to buy time in the Hello. Yes, I got nothing to buy time in the morning. Hello. 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 Please, we are in class. Oh. Hello. Mm -hmm. So if, if the teacher teaches you using the teacher center method and gives you an assignment to go and do on the same material the teacher have taught you. Now, in that at that moment, it is still student-centered method. The assignment itself is a student-centered method. Why? It is a student-centered method because the focus of that assignment is on you, the student to internalize the information yourself. When we say to internalize, what we mean is that we want you, the student, to make the information, to make the knowledge your own. So any method that helps you as a student to make the information your own becomes student-centered. So when you go and sit down to do the assignment, as you are writing, you are thinking, you have to search for your own knowledge. But if I give an assignment, you don't, even if I teach you and after that I still give the assignment, you don't just go and lift my nose exactly and put as an assignment. Do, do you just lift? We don't do that. If I give an assignment, you still have to go and look for additional knowledge to add to what the lecturer have given you. And so as you are looking for the additional knowledge, you are discovering more knowledge you come across things that your teacher did not know about. So the process, the process is a student learner is process. So it is an assignment, a student center. center. At the same time, I can give you an assignment put on a material that I have not taught you. So I'll give you an assignment on a material that I have not taught you. And I will not teach that material. It's a way of learning. I will not teach you that. So I can just look for one of the topics. For example, these teaching methods. I can just give an assignment on teaching methods. I will not teach you that. Oh, please, who are those? Hello. Very impressive. Who are those, please? Mute yourself. Sir, please, can you remove them from the class? Please remove them from the class. Mm -hmm. Obobo link no any day will be 7 pm no way close in that 7 pm so mo go wan kwere Obobo link na yedi na Priscilla Eh mommy find yourself now you dey at dem for things in the na be abey Wow No 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 Please uh, mute all of us, please. Meet everybody. This is not a, a matter of muting you. On remove your in our crap. Yes, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
because it looks like one say, say a friend. <laughs> So, sir, mm -hmm. press, like, mute yourself. Uh, please, could, could you check some? I'm calling her. I'm calling her to do that. So let please let's continue. We we'll work they'll work on it. So if they make me a host or co-host, then I can remove them. So the other methods that we are saying that assignment, I can give you an assignment on teaching methods. So if I give an assignment on teaching methods, it meant that you are going to search for the knowledge. So all these things I'm teaching you, you are going to look for the knowledge on it and give it to the teacher. So in that way, it serves as a student-centered learning method. So if I still teach you as a teacher again on teaching methods and I give you assignment at the end of the class, still on the teaching methods to go and sit down and write, it still becomes student-centered method because you are going to acquire this information and internalize it by yourself. So you will discover more and you add new knowledge to whatever I've taught you. So as far as you are going to add new knowledge and discover more information, it becomes student-centered method. So yes, it could be a teaching method, it could be a form of assessment. Both both you can explain. Thank you. So let's look at the, the teacher-student responsibility during learning. So here we are looking at it from the form of a student who have just come as a first year student. So let's pick it this way. First year student, second year student, and third year student. So what this is trying to say is that when you look at the picture, when you look at the picture here, we have two sessions. One okay. session is the yeah. teacher yeah. response. Okay. The other session is a student responsibility. So what can you see? You see that on the teacher responsibility from the beginning, you start from the bottom. You see that from the bottom, it is broad. But as it goes up, it becomes narrower. Can you see that on the teacher responsibility? You see that from the beginning, it becomes broad, but as it goes up, it becomes narrower. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, can you kindly use the Kaiser? Because uh, we are is, there space? is there a space? Yes, yeah, you see the space. You see that there's a line dividing student responsibility and student res uh, teacher responsibility. So on the half, on the Kaiser, where, uh, so this whole place, that's a teacher responsibility. So from here, from here, you see that here is very broad. At the beginning, the teacher responsibility is broad. Now, as you move upwards, you see that the teacher responsibility is becoming narrower. It's becoming narrower. Narrower and narrower as it comes. So teacher responsibility at the beginning is broader, is much, is more. But as we proceed, then it becomes narrower. 
the opposite is the student responsibility. So you see that in the student responsibility here, from the beginning, it's narrow. So the beginning is narrow, but as you move forward, it now widens. It becomes broader and broader and broader. And now very broad, see, very broad. So what are we trying to say using this? The responsibility, teacher responsibility and student responsibility. So on the teacher responsibility, we are saying that if you are teaching first year students, if you are teaching first year students as a teacher, your teaching methodology should be about getting more information to the student. So it means that the teacher who is teaching first year students will have more talking to do. So if I'm teaching first year students and I'm to select the type of teaching method for first year student, I have to select the type of teaching method where the teacher will have to do more of the knowledge. So the teacher will have to give more of the knowledge to the student. So you will realize that when you're in first year, level 300, look at the number of courses that you, you did in first semester. Did you look at the number of courses you did in first semester? You had but a yes. lot. Uh -huh, so, you had oh, a lot. Yes, please. Uh, so you see that in first semester, you had a lot, a lot of uh, courses, and we uh, were concerned with the knowledge. We wanted the teachers to give more knowledge, more knowledge. So the teacher will have to select a teaching method which is mostly lecture method. So you begin, in order to give the student more knowledge, you have to lecture always so that you can pass on a lot of information to the student. So when you are when you begin learning, when you begin learning in first year, we are saying that the teacher will have to give more information. So you mean the teacher will have to teach more. The teacher will have to do more of the teaching. Now, when you move forward, when you get to third, third year, when you get to third year, the teacher responsibility, so this is the end. So when you get to the end, that's a third year or your final year. As you are in your final year. So by next semester, what we are trying to say is that the teaching responsibility will reduce. The teaching responsibility will reduce for the teachers as you go to the final year. The teaching responsibility will reduce. Yes. And it means that the teacher, the teacher may have to select more practical or more revision strategies which will involve the student the more, but rather lessen the work for the teachers. So Norma, you see that uh, a lot of a lot of work like presentation, giving you presentation, it comes when you are you have passed, maybe you are in second year or you are in final year. So when you are in final year, most of the courses, you may just have to be doing presentations. So which means that the teacher the work of the teacher will reduce as the student progresses. The work of the teacher will reduce. So that's the teacher responsibility. From first year, the teacher will have to teach more. So you have to select methods that will make you teach more. That will make you give the, the learner a lot of information. But when the learner now gets to the advanced stage or the learner becomes matured, then you rather push most of the work to the learner and not the teacher again. So that's how you realize that when you are in final year, uh, most of the learning, the teaching methods that the lecturers will adopt, most of it is presentations, demonstrations, those things that you, the learner, have to rather do more and not the teacher. So it's the opposite of the student responsibility. So it means that as a student, when you are beginning, when you are beginning learning in first year, there is less, there's less of, let's say, the teaching method. Mostly you don't participate so much. 
So it's always lecture method. So less less respons responsibility for you. But as you progress to the final year, your responsibility now increases. Uh, so in final year, you, the student, you are now giving a lot of presentations. Most of the information, they give it to you to go and look for it yourself. Uh, so more assignment, more presentations, more teaching, more uh, practical work, more field work, all those things is when you are getting to the final year. So that's what we call the student-teacher responsibility during learning. So that is how it goes. The, the teacher responsibility decreases as the student progresses, but the student responsibility increases as the student progresses. So my dear student, that is why that is why when you progress in your in your learning, you are given more of the work to do by yourself instead of the lecturer doing it. It doesn't mean the lecturer, the lecturer maybe probably is wicked or does not want to teach. That is not like that. It is a principle of teaching and learning. And that when you become more mature, when you move to bigger classes, you have to take charge of your own learning. And the teacher is only to just guide you to learn. So more presentations, more group work, more field work, everything is more. So you are bedding to do everything by yourself. So that is the explanation of this diagram that you have seen, teacher responsibility and then student responsibility. Please, do, do you understand? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. So our next responsibility now is to look at some of the teaching methodologies. Uh, specific, we have to look at specific teaching methodologies. So the first one we can see here is the lecture method. That is what we are doing currently. So currently, you are all seated. We are in a Zoom class, and you are listening to only the lecturer talking and giving you every information. That's the lecture method. So what is it? What is the lecture method now? So the lecture method is 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 a, is a traditional method, which means is the is a is an old method of teaching. So traditional, it is an old method of teaching, and it is a verbal. Verbal, you give the information by talking. So verbal, you use words and a lot, and then it's a exponential. Exponential means that. We are exposing the knowledge. So as we said, it's a learner, it's a teacher-centered method. So we are exposing the knowledge to you through lecture. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in exposing the knowledge to you through the lecture method, you are able to give a large volume of information within a short possible time. So you, you realize that sometimes if you are being lectured on. Somebody can come for one, one hour lecture and the person can come and teach you about 50 slides just for one hour lecture. So imagine one hour lecture and I'm teaching you 50 slides. That means that I've given you more information. If I was to use any method, I couldn't have given you that information. So we are saying that the learner or the, the lecture method the lecture method gives large volume of information to the learner within the shortest possible time. Uh, so in lecturing, lecturing is not, is not the same as giving uh, tutorials. Or we 
we, we, we have a specific teaching. A lecture is just to expose the information to you. So in actual fact, in lecture, we are supposed to just give you points. So I mentioned the point to you. And that point I have mentioned to you is for you to go and read it yourself. It's for you to go and now sit down and learn it yourself. That is actually what a lecture does. A lecture is not to explain everything word for word for you when we project a slide. That is not lecturing. So if you really attend some universities, if you attend some universities or some particular lecturers, the way they teach, if they want to teach you using the proper lecture method, at the end of the day, you may not understand anything. You'll just be seeing the slides and you don't even understand anything in the slide. The person can just use only one picture to teach you about five pages. Just one picture to teach you about five pages. That is a proper lecture. You only bring few lectures, but you can teach a lot. Uh, so a lecture passes on a large volume of information to the student. So if that's the case, that means that the first advantage of a lecture is what? You are able to give large amount of knowledge. So see, look at the advantages. The ad first advantage of a lecture is that it helps you to be able to transmit large amount of knowledge to the learner. That's the first advantage. So if I ask you a question that a, a lecturer or a teacher wants to give 60, maybe 60 slides to a student within one hour, or a, a teacher want to pass on a large volume of information to his students within 30 minutes, which teaching methodology will be most appropriate? Let's talk so, about uh -huh. So that's a question I can just ask you. Yes, please. So take note. It's, it's just a simple question I can ask you. A teacher wants to pass on a large information to his students within 30 minutes or within a short possible time. Which of the methods is most appropriate? Then you just go for your lecture method. You just select it, shade it, and you are good to go. You don't have any problem. If I also ask that, a, which of this method is considered as the oldest method or it is a traditional method whether i say old or i say traditional is the same and and which of these methods is an old method and it exposes large volumes of information to the learners it is what the lecture lecture is. method the lecture method. So in the lecture method, this number two, we are saying that it stimulates curiosity. It stimulates curiosity and people's interest. Now, curiosity and people's interest. See, in the proper lecture method, we don't explain a lot of things. We just we just project a slide, talk about one or two things, and we move forward. So in that case, the student will be curious, hey, but all these things, what are they about? So the student want to now go and read more and find out exactly what the lecturer was trying to say. So trying to find out more based on the scant information you are giving, that's why we are saying that it stimulates curiosity. Yes, Anita, your hand is up. Uh, please, the advantages of the lecture method. Yes, please. Is it an uh, advantage to the student or can it be also to advantage to the lecturer because he passing a whole lot of information to us yes. for uh, the shortest possible time? Yes. It also limits her, his work. So okay. I'm saying that could it be advantage to the lecturer as well? And also the point one, a, a consistent amount of knowledge can be transmitted. Okay. So the knowledge has been transmitted, but mm -hmm. it's huge. And okay. every point is not being explained. And yes. you, the student, do not understand. So okay. for that one, is there an advantage to you? Okay. 
All right. So my sister, the question you have asked, it means that there are shortfalls of the lecture method. That's what you are trying to look at. Yes, it can be advantageous to one party, but it can also disadvantage the other word, party. So in this lecture method, it can advantage the, 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 the lecturer. The lecturer will be happy that, oh, I've been able to teach a large amount of information within one hour, so I have achieved my aim. It's like I'll finish the course content. So yes, the teacher is is is, is happy because it's to your advantage. But the other side, what about the learner? Would the learner also say, "Oh, your teaching method is advantageous to me"? No. Uh, so it might have effect on the learner, and that will now come to what the disadvantage. Uh, so it means that you can write this one as an advantage, the first point, as an advantage to the lecturer. But you can now rewrite this point as also a disadvantage to what? The student. So if you want to write the first point as a disadvantage to the student, what can you say? As you rightly said, you can say that a limits understanding of the material. So for the learner, a limits understanding of the material. So that becomes a disadvantage of the lecture method. Uh, so my, my sister, what we are saying is that yes, it can be advantageous to one party, but at the same time also disadvantage or it can disadvantage the other word, a party. So yes, it is not that it is advantageous to both the lecturer and the learner. Uh, so they have ad advantages and disadvantages. So one point can advantage another and disadvantage the other person. Thank you, sir. You are welcome, please. So because, because the first point, the lecturer has passed a large amount of information. It takes it takes student curiosity and the people in to be able to go and discover oh, my, my more. Oh, so my, my. Advantage. Well, uh, it will let you the, the student go and look for more information. So to stimulate curiosity in you. Curiosity means that you have to go and find out more. Why? Why that? Why this? Why that? You have to be interested in going back to read yourself and get more information on what the lecturer have said, presenting only points. And then we are saying that the peoples also know modalities to express themselves. So see when the lecturer is teaching and the lecturer is well organized. So the lecturer starts organizing the material well. So you see that there are some particular lecturers, the way they teach you, you are also able to replicate their teaching method whenever you are also given assignment. So you are able to also organize your work according to that. And you know how to speak, how to speak, how to start speaking. If you are also given the opportunity as a student to come and lecture. So we are saying that it helps through what the, the lecturer lectures, it tells the student to know certain modalities to express themselves as well when they get the opportunity to. Uh, then still on the advantage, student can receive additional information. So looking at the lecture method, if you are teaching a technical topic, if you are teaching a technical topic, which is about maybe demonstration, you are seeing any of the other methods. But you can use a lecture method to give background, to give a background to whatever you are coming to do, or to add up more information to whatever you are coming to do using a different method as well. So that's always a student can receive additional information. So I want to teach you demonstration on hand washing. But before I teach you demonstration on hand washing, I can give you a lecture, a lecture on hand washing. So that lecture I'm giving you on hand washing 
it is an additional information I'm giving you to the demonstration I'm coming to do later on. Uh, so I could have just used only demonstration, but you can also add the lecture method to give additional information before you even do the demonstration. So that's the additional information that you can use a lecture method to buttress the other teaching methods. So the disadvantage, as my sister said, the disadvantage. So look at the disadvantages, which are very common. So one, it generates what? Mm -hmm. So the, the learner becomes passive and not active in the process. So you become passive means that you can't reserve. You can't reserve. You don't participate. I'm just pouring. I'm just pouring the information on you. And you are just sitting down and receiving it. So it it it, it makes it makes the student not to be actively participating in any of the learning materials. Then there's loss of attention and bore down. So it's not easy. Mm -hmm. We are teaching you for a number of minutes. You are tired. You can't concentrate again. You are down in spirit. So all these are disadvantages. Mm -hmm. Loss of attention and bore down. Sometimes you don't even feel like listening to, to what the lecturer is saying. But you just decide, you just put your phone on. And right now, as I'm even talking, some people, if I ask a question now, they are they are on the lecture, but they are not listening. Is that not it? You have joined. You are a participant. But if you ask a question now, some people probably, mm -hmm. the phone is even in their, it, it is maybe in their living room and they are somewhere in the kitchen even cooking. But they put it on loudspeaker and they are listening. So it's it's a dis disadvantage. It's a disadvantage to a lecture method. Then it do not allow you. So individualizing. Why it me meant is that it does not allow you to own the information as an individual. So I'm just teaching you, and you feel like, oh, master is just giving us the information. So it is not my information. So let it is not my it is not mine. It is let teacher who is giving it to us. So you don't make the information yours. That's what we are trying to say. The information does not become yours. But if you use a different method where you are to be involved, student centered method, then the information becomes yours. But in learner centered the Sir Christiana is painting the screen. Oh. Oh. Please, who is painting this? Stop. So, yes, yeah, the disadvantage, my sister said, there's uh, the, 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 you are passive, you are, there's lots of attention, there's bored down. The information is not yours. You do not own the information. That's individualizing. It doesn't become your information. You feel like, oh, it's for it's the lecturer who is teaching us, so the information is not mine. So basically, that is the lecture method. All you need to know about the lecture method is that, one, it is an old method. It's a traditional method. Two, it is a teacher-centered method. Three, it exposes information to the learner. Four, more information or live volume of information is transmitted using the lecture method. So disadvantages, it, may, it makes the student to bore, it makes them lose concentration. The students are not active, so they become passive. These are virtually what you need to know about the lecture method. <laughs> Oh, that's not competition. What about this demonstration? To demonstrate. Hello, sir. Yes. Please, can you make me go? 
بعدين I should make you co-host. No. I will be muting those talking. And I have to I think that. I'm, I'm... Uh -huh. Yeah. All right, so I'm also a co host, so I have to then create awareness. Right. So who wants... Please, who wants to become the co host? Uh, Beatrice, can you do your work? Okay, give me the name. Okay. Yes. Pause there, man. Pause there, man. You want to begin the co-host or you want to ask a question? Co-host, please. Okay, all right. Let me just... So let me start with the demonstration. Will demonstration be learner-centered method or teacher-centered method? Let's start from there. What is your view? Learner-centered. Learner-centered. And teacher-centered. Teacher-centered. Okay. It can be both. It can be what? Both. It can be both. Yes, please. All right. So yes, yeah. can be both. I said that. So it depends on the one that gives the demonstration. Yes. Yeah, so it can become both. So demonstration could be both. It could be both learner centered or teacher centered. So that's why we have demonstration. Sometimes we have return what demonstration, meaning that it is. Uh, please, uh, yes, I want to make somebody a co host or I can remove them by myself. Who was okay? All right, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'll be back here. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Sorry. Uh, uh, Safwa, is Safwa here? Safwa, please, are you here? Sir, please, yes. At first, I was busy a little, but now I'm here. I think you are meeting a co-host. Okay, sir, so don't worry, I'll remove them for you. And I'm, told, I'm told you are made a co-host, so you... And... Oh, okay, sir, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so yes, we said demonstration can be both, depending on which angle is coming from. Yeah, so that's why I have demonstration and return demonstration. All right. So what, what then is demonstration? What then is demonstration? What are we trying to do in demonstration? So we are saying that demonstration try to make an information more concrete. So demonstration try to make an information or an idea more concrete. Uh, so more concrete means that demonstration tried to condense or to simplify the idea in a practical or a form that you can touch, you can touch and feel. So that makes it concrete, you can touch and feel. So you are practicalizing the idea 
to touching of feeling. Uh, so that's why we said that you are condensing or you are simplifying the idea or the information into a concrete object or an action. Uh, either an object or an action. An object maybe I just showing. Uh, you, so pass, but the action, you are demonstrating the steps or the process. Or we are saying that you can just substitute objects. You can substitute objects. So here we are trying to say that in demonstration, you may not have the ideal thing, but you can use other similar objects to improvise as we have been doing as nurses. Uh, improvision is our hallmark. We are good at that. Uh, so we can substitute, we can improvise real objects with similar ones to better for better understanding. Uh, so it makes you concrete. It makes a person to be able to practicalize the idea. Uh, but in the not in a lecture method, we are just pouring, pouring, pouring. So you are not even seeing anything. I'm just mentioning the words, but I don't even know how how they how they look like. You don't even know. Uh, but we are saying that in demonstration, you are bringing the idea into practicality, into real situation for the people to see it, to touch it, and to feel it. So if that is it, so it means that if if you, you are given a question that uh, maybe, maybe you are the midwife and you, you want to pass information to your junior midwives, on any procedure or maybe on hand washing, which, which teaching method will be most appropriate. Uh, so since you want to make hand washing not in a lecture form, but you want to demonstrate and practicalize it, then it becomes demonstration. So the advantage of demonstration, one is that it allows you access to concrete objects that can be assessed within limits of time and space. So what we are trying to say that in in a or phenomena. So phenomena is any any occurrence, any occurrence. Phenomena is any occurrence. So the advantage is that there are a lot of phenomena that you can make it concrete. You can practicalize it. For people, though they cannot see the real thing, they cannot touch the real thing, but you are able to improvise it with concrete and touchable materials so that the, the person will take it that, oh, okay, whenever I hear sun, whenever I hear star. So the star is up in the sky. You cannot touch it. But in teaching, how stars are. We have concrete ones. So we have the shape, we have the shape of a star. So you give you display the shape. This is the shape of a star. It's like the, the brain, the human brain. You don't see the brain. You don't see the brain. But you are able to get the part of the brain and let the stream touch it, feel it. So yeah, like the pelvis. You are doing, you are metal, you are pelvis. So you are teaching me for that. So you realize that if I'm teaching reproductive anatomy on the structure of the pelvis, inside you, inside you, you may not be able to see the pelvic bones. But to make it concrete, we have a practical object. That is a pelvis. So we bring it to you. That's why you are shown the pelvis. You are given the pelvis to touch all the bones to see where they are located. So that is demonstration. So it has simplified the, the abstract information into something you can see, something you can touch so that you understand it better. Now, it can be used for a long time. 
So what I say that when you demonstrate, when you demonstrate, the knowledge from demonstration can be stored and can be used for a long time. So if I give you the structure of ellipse, okay, I want to teach you maybe the, 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 the stages of delivery and stages of labor. And we have the anatomical, we have the woman, the model. Then we, we put we put the baby inside. Then we let the head crown for you to see. Uh, so we have those models in the skills lab. So you enter the skills lab. You, you have seen the picture, how the crowning is done. You have seen how the shoulder will be delivered first. So practical, all those concrete objects are there. The process is there. You touch every process of it, of the labor process. You touch it. So when you learn that kind of information, you are able to use it for a long period of time. And that is what most of you are using now. Uh, the stages of labor was practicalized. It was put into a concrete object for you. And you saw it. You used the dummy. You used the models. And that is what you are now using at your website. So you are able to use this information for a long time. Because you, you felt it. You saw it. So it stays with you for a very long time. Then we are saying that another advantage is that you don't need to have the real object or you don't need to have the real thing before you can do demonstration. But you can rather use a substitute or you can what improvise. Uh, so the improvisation or the substitute is less expensive than the originals. Uh, it's less expensive than the originals. Uh, so that's why in our various skills lab, we have a lot of substitutes. We have a lot of things that we have improvised. And all those improvised ones, if we were to get the real object, the cost, the cost alone would have been too much. I uh, mean, we can't even get it with, with the little resources we have. But through the demonstration, at least the cost is minimized. So you are able to get substitutes for that at a cheaper cost. And that is what we are we are referring to. That demonstration helps us with these advantages. You have access to concrete objects. You can use it for a long time. As you are all practicing at your various places, you are using mm -hmm. knowledge from demonstration. You are using knowledge from demonstration. And then... The objects that we use for demonstration, they are less expensive. They are less expensive. Now, what about disadvantages? Are there some disadvantages of demonstration? Yes. So every method has advantages and disadvantages. Now, disadvantages you realize that sometime when you are in the school lab and they are doing demonstration they may not be coherence or they will not be correlation they may not be correlation or coherence and you can easily get confused you can easily get confused Especially because it is in a form of steps. It's in a form of steps. So, and it goes step by step. And the step by step must reflect what is done in reality. But you realize that in the demonstration method, what is done in reality might not correlate with what you are demonstrating. Like it might not go point for point. It might not go point for point. So you might use the demonstration and the demonstration method that you have used. When the person goes to encounter reality, reality, the reality in terms of arrangement will be different from how you have been demonstrated to. And that is why we have challenges as nurses and midwives. 
when you are a student, where you are demonstrated to in the classroom or in the skills lab. You see that when you go to the website, when you go to a website, the real thing is the relation between how you have been demonstrated to your lab and the actual procedure that is carried out at the world. Sometimes you are confused whether what the teacher taught you is a right procedure or what is done at the world is a right procedure. So that's a lack of correlation we are referring to. Uh, that's a lack of correlation we are referring to. So you, you have to know that that is a disadvantage. They, they could just be, there's no correlation. There's differences. Uh, you that, That's what we are referring to. Then we are saying that one disadvantage is that it requires special technical equipment. It requires special technical equipment. So we, you, as, as midwives, you see that most of the models that we need to use at the skills lab, they are technical. <laughs> Some of the machines, they are technical. And if you don't have this technical know-how, you don't have the technical know-how, you can have the materials all right, but you may not be able to use a demonstration method. Is there, but can you operate it? You might not be able to operate. So at our various, our various skills lab, you see that there are certain models, there are certain machines that we have in the skills lab. But because we don't have the technical know-how, you might not be able to operate that machine during demonstration. So you have to wait till you are able to get somebody who can operate that machine and we can use it and use it well. Now, let me even take this example of uh, bed making, bed making. When you're in school, bed making, you see that we have types of beds. And the types of beds that we have, some of them, you can raise the head side, you can raise the middle side, the bottom side, you can raise the leg side. Even the bed side rails, the bed side rails, lifting the bed side rails to protect the patient. These are all technical equipments. So just even a, a bed alone, a bed alone, you might want to teach your student bed making in the skills lab at demonstration. But if you don't uh, know how to manage the bed, if you don't know how to operate the bed so well, you may yes. go to a skills lab for demonstration and you may want to demonstrate maybe cardiac bed how how to raise the head side of the bed. And you might not even know where, where to go and touch to raise the head side of the bed. So if you don't have this technical knowledge and you don't have this kind of technical equipment, you can't do the demonstration. So that's what we are saying. It's a disadvantage to the demonstration method. And then it also uses complicated procedures and pretentious language that can distract the student from the essence of the activity. Okay. So you see that in the, there are some of the, the, the procedure, yes, it involves complicated procedures, demonstrating. And we are saying that it may even destroy your attention. You may not even understand whatever that you are being demonstrated to. It's a disadvantage. So the demonstration method, we are saying the disadvantage is that there will be, there can be a disconnect. There can be a disconnect or there's a, dis, a, 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 the correlation is not there, lack of correlation between what you are taught using demonstration and between what exists in reality. There could be a lot of difference. Then it requires special technical equipment. And then it involves complicated processes which can distract your attention. So basically on the demonstration method, what I want you to pick is that the demonstration method involves simplifying, simplifying information. Simplifying information 
into practical or concrete form for easy understanding or for easy assimilation. Yeah, simplifying the information. And that's very good. And that in terms of the advantages as we have looked at. Yes. Yes. Let me take it again. It's uh, the uh, demonstration. You said it involves it involves simplifying an information into practical. All right. So simplifying an information into a practical form. Hmm? Or concrete form for easy for easy assimilation or easy understanding. Uh, for easy assimilation or easy what understanding. Okay, thank you. Okay, you are welcome. So Let's do the last thing, then we we'll close the class. This is the last thing, brainstorming, brainstorming method. So when then uh, after the next three slide, we'll close the class. So when brainstorming, so look at the picture. Look at what we have. Brain, brainstorming from the brain. So you see that from the brain, from each of the brain of the people you have here, they are thinking about something different. Uh, each person from the brain, see that from the brain, each person is thinking about something different. Uh, each person is bringing out a different idea from the brain. So that's a simple pictorial form of brain storming, brain generating different ideas generating different ideas to the same question or to the same problem by different what individuals or by different learners so that is brainstorming now there are some keywords i want you to note under brainstorming the first one is that Brainstorming produces knowledge and it creates knowledge. Uh, so brainstorming helps you to produce or to create new ideas. So brainstorming generates, it produces or it creates new ideas. So it brings about creativity, creativity. You generate your own ideas, new ideas from your brain. And each person generates different new ideas. Now, why do we do brainstorming? The basic principle is that quantity generates quality. Quantity generates quality. That's the basic principle of brainstorming. What we are trying to say is that the more ideas we get, the more ideas we get, the more quality information we are likely to achieve. So look at this. Five people are here. And see the five people. Each person is generating about five different ideas basically about five different ideas so it means that we are going to get more ideas more ideas through brainstorming so the more ideas is what quantity quantity so brainstorming helps us to get more ideas that means it, it leads to quantity of information now, when we get more ideas, what is now saying is that the more ideas help us to get quality ideas from the more ideas. So if you, you ask the same question and you have five students and these five students, they're able to give you 
25 different ideas. 25 different ideas. So the 25 different ideas becomes quantity. So you have used brainstorming to get a lot of information quantity. Now, the lot of the 25 ideas that you have, you will see that the 25 ideas, some of them can be combined to make quality ideas. So you can combine about two or three of them, two or three ideas to now make it a formidable or a more quality idea. So 25 ideas, but the 25 ideas can lead to about 10, 10 quality ideas. So that's why we're saying a quantity generates quality. The more ideas you get, we can now combine some of the ideas to now get better ideas. So quantity generates quality. That is a principle that brainstorming operates on. Now, you have to understand that brainstorming, the hallmark of brainstorming is what? Creativity. Creativity. Brainstorming brings about our creativity. Hello, Maybe sir. Yes, please. Sorry, please cancel that mute herself. She's giving us bad feedback. So she's the one we are hearing the noise from. Oh. Okay. Sauda, can she please mute herself? Okay. Okay. Safwa. Safwa, that mute uh, Sauda, please. So the second point, we are saying that creativity Creativity is a hallmark of brainstorming. So brainstorming leads to creativity. You create more ideas using brainstorming. And the last point, I want you to get the, the last point. Take note of it. Brainstorming has a beneficial effect on interpersonal relationships. So please underline the word interpersonal relationships so brainstorming help us to form interpersonal relationships and what is interpersonal relationship mm. that's interaction interaction between two or more people from one so from one individual you interact with a different individual so inter across so across, across different individuals. So when you are asked a brainstorming, what we are saying that individually people brainstorm alone. Then after each person have generated ideas, then we now see the ideas across people. So in the picture, we have five people here. And we see that uh, they are paired two to two to. So interpersonal two to. The first person I generate the ideas, the second person generate. Then they put their ideas together. So they brainstorm individual and put their ideas together. So it, it, it is across people. So we are saying that it leads to, it has a beneficial effect on interpersonal relationships. That means that you benefit from the ideas of the other person. Uh, so your ideas are there, but you are also able to benefit from the ideas of the other person. So the key point I want you to take from here is that brainstorming brings about creativity. Brainstorm brings about creativity. In brainstorming, large amount of ideas are created. And then this large of, uh, amount of ideas created leads to now quality ideas, quality of fewer ideas. And that brainstorming have a beneficial effect on interpersonal relationships. Uh, so if I ask a question that, which of the following teaching methodology has an, a beneficial effect on interpersonal relationships, then you go for brainstorming. 
if you are also asked that, which of the following teaching methodology leads to creativity? Mm -hmm. So brainstorming. So we are looking at these things, the major thing, just pick the major ideas and you move forward with it. So will brainstorming have advantages or disadvantages? So we have all, already looked at the advantages. So it stimulates creativity. So creativity is its hallmark. Then there's critical thinking. So it involves the mind. You have to be able to think. So there's it, it leads to critical thinking. You think on your own and you bring your own ideas. Then it helps you to argue. Because you have your own ideas, you have to be able to convince others with your ideas. So it helps you to argue your ideas. So in arguing, it helps you develop communication skills. You have to know how to communicate what you are thinking in your mind to others. Uh, you have to brainstorm and communicate it, develop how to transmit what is in your mind to others. Then there's active participation. So in brainstorming, everybody thinks from the mind. So as you think from the mind, you have to, you are involved in the teaching and learning process. Does it have disadvantages? Yes. It does disadvantages. What are the disadvantages? It is time consuming. Time consuming. So if, if a teacher enters a class and I get, for example, science and sentence of science and sentence of which condition will you bring? Mm -hmm. Which condition will bring up? Okay, let's say abortion. Yeah. Yes. Or any other condition. So if I want to teach a science and sentence of any condition, within five minutes, I can just teach you. I can just mention them, explain them within five minutes. I can just mention, oh, these are A, B, C, D. This one is this, this one is that. Within five minutes, I can tell the science and sentence. But if you also want to be brainstorming, you can decide to ask the students, to brainstorm on the signs and symptoms. And that can take you like 30 minutes. 30 minutes. 30 minutes because you have to ask the question first. Then after asking the question, you have to allow the student to think. Each person will think and create his or her own ideas and then bring them out. So you see that it is time consuming. Something that I can use a lecture method to just teach within five minutes. If I'm using brainstorming, I, I may use like 30 minutes. So that's why I say it is time consuming. It is also difficult, it can be tedious. And it is a lot of work for the participants. Uh -huh. You have to think a lot, you have to bring a lot of ideas together and condense them to get quality ideas. So as I said, you can get about 20 ideas. Then you are still told that, or oh, present only five ideas out of the 20 ideas, which means that you have to match some ideas to get the most quality ideas to present. So it becomes tedious and it's a lot of work for the participants. So then lastly, it proposes possible solutions to solve the problem, not an effective solution. So whatever ideas that you think are correct, we are saying that those are possible solutions, possible ideas that can solve the problem, but they are not. They might not be the exact or the most effective solution for the problem. Uh, you are just bringing ideas from your mind. You are bringing ideas from your mind, but it doesn't mean that those ideas will be the ideal ideas to solve that problem. But you are brainstorming. And you are bringing ideas from your mind. So you see that the brainstorming, most of us who go for workshops, we use the brainstorming a lot. And that's why we said it's tedious and demanding. Uh, you are just giving five minutes lecture and you are using about one hour or two hours to do brainstorming. And if you go for 
workshops, especially organized by by white by white funded organizations. Uh, you you realize that most of their workshop is about brainstorming. Everything is brainstorming. Generate the ideas. You have to generate all the ideas. Which sometimes is tedious. You are tired, but you have to think. You have to bring out more ideas as to the possible way to solve the issue. So these are the disadvantages of the brainstorming method. Time consuming, tedious, and demanding. These are major things that you have to look at. So I will, I will pause here if you have any question to ask or any contribution, you can bring it on board. So the floor is open. If somebody want to add up more, yes, Elom, your hand is up. Yes, sir. Yes. Please, if we should go back to the student-centered approach, Okay. The assignment, the assignment that we mentioned, can you okay. also be put under exercise, or they are two separate, uh, separate uh, uh, approaches? Can it also be? Except for the student-centered approach. Okay. We did mention assignment. Okay. So I'm asking, can exercise be part of the assignment, or it also have to be a different approach on its own under the student-centered approach? Okay, so assignment, assignment is a broader term. Assignment is a broader term. If I say I'll give you an assignment, the assignment could be in any form. And one of the form, if you also say exercise, exercise is an assignment. Uh, so exercise is an assignment, uh, and that's not only all. So assignment, if you really want to look at it, assignment is a broader term, of which exercise is an assignment. So it's not going to be something di di different, or it's not going to be something separate, uh, but exercise is an assignment. Are you okay, my sister? Okay, sir. Thank you. Yes, you are welcome. Any other contribution or question? Yes, Portia. Portia, Hello, sir. yes. Sir, please. Then, um, where are we going to classify um assessment as in examination? Because for that, the teacher is going to like the MCQs. The teacher will provide you the informations. Then maybe you choose. Or maybe if it's a theory question, that one you will provide your own answers on the sheet. So where are we going to classify that one also? Thank you. So, yes, thank you. So assessment. Assessment cannot be classified in this our teaching and learning method. Assessment is also a broader term on its own, just like teaching methods. So like teaching methods is a broader term that we study, it's a topic we study in education. So assessment as a whole, assessment as a whole is a topic or a course on its own, which we can classify it as a whole under teaching methods. So it's just like, uh, I cannot say that teaching methodologies can be classified under assessment. So that's the point I'm coming from. You cannot, assessment is a broader term. In fact, assessment is a course on its own. It's a specialty on its own. Somebody can just go and do PAD, PAD on only assessment. So if you mention the word assessment, assessment as a word cannot be classified uh. to a particular teaching 
method because it is not method. It's also called assignment. It is also called assessment. Assessment is not a teaching method, and a teaching method is not assessment. Uh, so, my sister, if you are using the broader terms, you can classify assessment under teaching method. You can also classify teaching method under assessment. Unless you you are referring to specific components or specific examples, then we can try to look at it. But assessment as a term, as a broader term, is, is on its own. It's a specialty on its own. And methodology is also a specialty on its own. One is not under the other. That's virtually what I'm trying to say. One is not under the other. Please, Portia, did you get it? Yes, please. But say, please, um, I think um assignment is also in the form of an assessment or yeah, assignment could, could be a form of assessment. Assignment could also be a form of met, a teaching methodology. So you can use okay. assignment as a teaching methodology. You can use assignment as an assessment. Why is assess, uh, assignment a teaching methodology? I can use as assignment on a topic which I will not teach. So that's a teaching methodology and it's learner center. I've given it to you. So okay. I'm not so I'm not going to like I'm supposed to teach it, but instead of me teaching it, I give it to you as an assignment. Okay. That is methodology on its own. So it could be as uh, when you take as assignment in that angle, you are using assignment as a teaching methodology for the student to go and acquire the knowledge by him or herself. So that becomes a, a, a learner-centered teaching methodology. OK, so, thank you, sir. Yes, you are welcome. Please, any other concern? Mm -hmm. All right. So, if we don't have further contributions uh, for today, we will end the lecture here. So next week, we will try to complete the methodology. So next week, we'll complete them. And then we can do the, ass the assessment as, you, 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 as a topic on its own. Yes, so next week, we'll end this. Then next two weeks, we can do assessment. Uh, for the assessment at your level, uh, for what I want you to achieve because of the time, I can use one lecture to teach assessment uh, for your level. I can use one week. So lecture period to teach assessment. So, but uh, the quiz, the quiz, are there some people who do not take part and they, you, you, you want me to know? You can let me know later on. If you know that I do not take part in the quiz, please, you have to let me know. Because if you don't come forward and we I print out the results and we enter, you don't come later and see that the, the grade I had is like mid-semester is not added. If you say that, did you write mid-semester? So I realized that that's a challenge with some of us with our results. Uh, you you will see that maybe if you get a low mark and you know we're using computer platform. So if I'm the lecturer and I yet decide to go and print out only my mid-semester scores and sit down to enter that for your, you realize that at the end of the day, when I enter, some people still have a lot of spaces, which means that they did not take part in their mid-semester quiz. Uh, so you may have space, you may not have score for mid-semester, but you may have score for end of semester exams. So please don't do not be a victim of some of these things. Uh, because the issues are many. Don't be a victim. If you know you haven't taken part in any mid-semester or any class assignment, you have to own up. You have to follow the lecturer. You don't have to wait for the lecturer. We there, yeah, we have so much work. Uh -huh. Some lecturer may have time for you to still follow you for class course. Uh, 
we add others to based on the work schedule may not follow you for class or whatever they see is whatever they enter on the score sheet. So whether you have assignment or not, it is presented like that. So when you see your score, you say that, oh, say, I think I don't deserve this mark. Yes, you might not deserve that mark. But when we are tracing, you might see that you are even the cause of that low mark that you have had. So please, I'm urging you, let us all do our best with the assessment that we are giving. Do our best as summit or assessment. Take part in all mid-semester quizzes so that you are sure that you get the, 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 the mark that you also deserve as a student. Uh, so thank you for today. Sorry. Yes, thank Sir. you. Yes, please. Sir, please, um, based on what you just said, All most right. of the courses, we don't get to see our marks for the mid same, the assignments we do, presentations. And then at the end of the semester, when the results come, so we don't see class assessment score. We only see the final score. We don't know whether that one is for both exam and all the assessments we did or it's just for the exam. So it, it's disturbing. So if anything can be done about it, most of the courses, we don't see our, our, our marks. Uh, what do you, is it, I, is it like you do the Zoom and maybe later uh, like you, you, you do the mid-sem on a Zoom and you don't know your mark? And um, some, um, for last, last semester, for instance, some were done on the V class, we didn't see a mark. Some were done with Google Forms, we didn't see a mark. Some of the teachers would forward our results to us, but most of them didn't. And then the end of semester results to that came, and we only saw the final score, like exam score. We didn't see class assessments. So say maybe 60, then you, the grade. And like, but we don't get to see that this is from class assessments, compiling of maybe made same um, assignments or quizzes, presentation, the total score for that plus your exams, your exam score, then your final grade. We don't get to see that decision. Yeah, okay. That's that's all right, all right. So in the okay, so I think mm -hmm, that one assessment, assessment, as I say, it's a full course on its own. Uh -huh, and assessment has a lot of impact on all these things you are seeing and uh, sometimes when you look at the display of the results for example the in the final mark uh, in every every institution's display of results you are not showing or they, you are you are not giving exam score and mid semester score because of the way the software is designed you are it is only the total mark that you are given on your results. So if uh, for the exam score and then the mid sem score, that one is from the lecturer. Uh, so it's a lecturer who submits, who submits the score sheet. Uh, and the score sheet that the lecturer submits, it contains 70% for your exam score, then it contains 30% for your class score. Uh, so for class score, as you know, mid-semester, somebody can take all the 30 marks for only mid-semester as a class score. Another lecturer too can decide to make mid-semester about 20 marks or even 15 marks and can make presentation 10 marks and can make class participation 5 marks. But the bottom mark is that at the end of the day, each lecturer must submit a score sheet that contains 30% and 70%. Uh, so for that one, as a student, it cannot be displayed to you because of the way the system is designed. Uh, but if if you 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 can only get that from the from the lecturer, or because for confirmation of results, for example, if results are released and you are not comfortable with a grade. As far as it is not a zero, as far as it is not a zero written on it, uh, then it means that if you have clarifications, you can first contact the exam officer 
then you can reach out to a lecturer if you want further clarifications on that score sheet. But the system will not display 70% and 30% for you in the results. It will only display your total mark out of 100. Uh, and so maybe that, that could be another time. If, if, if you wanted to discuss this, we can make it another time where you can have more time to look at it. Yes, so, but... Thank you, yeah. but I'm saying that if we get to see our... You've given us assignments, you've given us medicine. As to whether what we... The answers we gave you is correct. Or, as students, we need to know the question. So my opinion is that going forward, if there's a way the board can encourage our tutors to give us the results for our medicines, all of them, so that we know when to set up, it will boost our confidence to prepare adequately for the exam as well. All Thank right. you. You are welcome. Sir, please, can I have your number? I have a personal something to discuss with you. Yeah, my number is on this lecture notes. Oh, okay. Uh, but you can also get it from, I think, most of Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, we can get my number. All right. So please, our time is up. Let's end the meeting. The next lecture meeting. God bless you, sir. You're welcome. You're welcome. So all the best and have a good day. Bye. 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 Bye.